Welcome back. We're in business in Riyadh at the Global Competitiveness Forum. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is China's biggest trading partner in West Asia. The kingdom, like the U.S. and many economies, is starting to look east to find markets for its products. But are global investors pinning their hopes on a soon to burst bubble? Well, famed hedge fund manager Jim Chano says beware. In fact, this week he's going to unveil some research he's done to back up his bet that perhaps the world's fastest growing economy shouldn't be bet on as such a sure thing. He's giving a speech at Oxford later in the week, but he spoke with us first. Jim Chanos, hedge fund manager of Kinecos, earlier today joined me from London, and I began by asking if he could explain why he's selling China short. We're, we're not betting against China. There's a, a, a number of misconceptions about, uh, about what we're saying. Uh, and what we are saying in, in a series of talks that, uh, that I'm giving this week in the UK um, is that uh, uh, China is undergoing a property bubble and a fixed investment bubble. Now, we're not making any calls on the Chinese economy overall or the, uh, the currency or the current account mm -hmm. status vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. and the West. But what is pretty clear to us based on our work is that there is a monumental property bubble and, uh, and fixed asset investment bubble that uh, China has underway right now. And deflating that gently will be difficult at best. It's an important point you're making there because you're not betting against Chinese growth per se. You're saying you're finding issues with the sustainability or perhaps some areas uh, that there are asset bubbles. Let me ask you, though, I mean, we've seen the Chinese increase the reserve requirements. They've asked some banks to limit lending. They've raised the yield on, you know, three-month and one-year builds. What would you need to see for them to do before you were more comfortable that they had some of those those bubbles uh, under control? I, I mean, uh, recent history uh, in our economy and, and here in Western Europe tells us that uh, that that deflating bubbles is no uh, is no easy feat. And uh, we're just going to monitor things like everybody else. But the problem with this is, is that the people that have, have brought you the bubble are now the ones who are going to supposedly deflate it. Uh, the issue is that this is all on the back of the Chinese government. And uh, unlike the West, where GDP is the result of the uh, actions of free market participants, uh, in China, it's the exact opposite, Margaret. In China, the economy runs to the tune of the GDP growth target. That is, g there's a GDP growth target set, mm -hmm. and then uh, levers are pulled and buttons are pushed to get there. And I think that that's a major, major difference. Uh, it's sort of like the old Soviet five-year plans, although done a lot more efficiently. I want to ask you, because when you came out with this call, or there were reports of this call, not the detail that you're giving now, it raised a lot of skeptics to come to the forefront, some notable ones. I mean, I've gotten notes from, from some of the biggest China watchers out there asking me to ask you how you're, you're coming up with some of this, this level of skepticism that you seem to have. Jim O'Neill said to me, uh, you know, that line that you had that China could be Dubai times 1,000, he said the only similarity he sees is that the population of China 900 times bigger than that of Dubai. That if China gets to Dubai's wealth per head, uh, you'd be at $50 trillion. Can you explain uh, that specific quote to me that, that China could be Dubai times 1,000? Well, my critics have glommed on to all kinds of things and, and, and don't seem to sometimes see tongue firmly placed in cheek. Uh, I, I said Dubai, uh, uh, China could be Dubai times 100 or 1,000. We'll see. Um, the thousand clearly uh, times it, talking about population, uh, the lower number talking about things like debt level and, and, and other things. Uh, you know, my critics have glommed on to uh, the fact that uh, um, I've never been in mainland China, for example. Uh, and yet Mr. O'Neill himself uh, admittedly had never been in three of the four bricks that he so aptly and profitably named uh, back in 01. He'd only been to one of them. Uh, so, it, it, you know, I, I take all these things with a big grain of salt. Um, we expect to be knocked in these kinds of things. There's a lot of people who have a lot of riding on China. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was the same thing when we talked Sorry. about uh, uh, residential real estate a few years back or the credit rating agencies or, God forbid, Enron or something like that. I mean, uh, you expect to get, uh, you expect to get uh, people throwing stones at you when you live in glass houses, I guess.
I, I want to ask you quickly here, um, you are a hedge fund manager here, very notable one. Uh, I want to ask for your outlook on your industry, given some of the recent uh, regulatory proposals we've seen in the United States, among them uh, portioning off hedge funds, private equity, proprietary trading from investment banks. What is this going to do to your industry? Um, I don't know. It's too early to tell because, uh, you know, we've seen we've seen the heat and, and uh, the reality in the last year has been that the uh, that the actual regs tend to get watered down after the initial rhetoric. Um, I'm actually hoping that's not the case. I, I think these activities should be separate and we've called for that. Um, you know, in many ways, it could make uh, it could make life easier for the uh, for the external hedge fund manager. Uh, we won't be competing with the big proprietary trading desks for some of this activity. So you're supporting the Volcker rule. I'm a big supporter of the Volcker rule.